Hi folks, welcome to Astronomy Live. This is a tutorial on how to use the latest version of Rocket Tracker, a program I developed for tracking rocket launches with off-the-shelf telescope hardware. You can find a link to the source code in the video description, but if you would like a pre-compiled executable that you can just download and run on a Windows computer, if you join as a channel member, you can find a link to compiled versions of both Rocket Tracker and Sat Tracker on my community tab. I make the latest versions of both these programs available to channel members. Once you've downloaded it, it's yours to keep forever. There's no digital rights management that's going to block you. But if you want to continue to be a channel member, you'll continue to receive updates as I update these programs. I want to thank all of my channel members for their support. You guys make it possible for me to continue developing new versions of my software and continuing to go out to these launches to test them. So thank you guys for all of your support. Let's now take a look at the hardware I recommend for use with Rocket Tracker. Here's the setup I use for most of the launch tracking I do these days. And I know what you're thinking. What's with the collapsed fence in the background? Well, you can thank Hurricane Ian for that one. The telescope is an 11-inch Celestron Nexstar GPS. The modern version of this telescope mount, which should also be compatible with my software, is the CPC-1100. On top, I have an Orion ST-80 refractor and a Canon T5i SLR. On the bottom, I have the Finder camera. This is an SCB-2000, a Samsung security camera with a C-mount lens, just a 55mm lens on the front of that guy, and you can see the counterweight system, as well as the homebrew focus motor control system between the fork arms of the mount. Now let's talk about the non-telescope hardware. For the joystick, I'm using an X52 Pro hands-on throttle and stick system, or HOTAS. Pretty much any HOTAS will be good for this application. You do want a good quality joystick with a good resolution set of encoders on it, and probably a separate throttle system like this so that you can have fine control over exactly how sensitive the joystick is. I also tend to use an external mouse with the laptop because that makes it a little easier for me to click the target in the video viewfinder. The laptop itself is an older Core i5 HP gaming laptop. Some other accessories that I like to use include a Feel World Brightview 1080p external monitor that I will hook up to the main Blackmagic camera and this provides a separate external monitor that I can use to track the rocket and see the view straight from the main camera. I also have a Roxio DVD capture card that I use to capture the analog video from the Samsung security camera. But if I'm using an ELP USB camera I can omit this accessory. I also have a USB to serial connection, of course, for the older Celestron Nexstar GPS telescope. If you have a newer Nexstar telescope, it will probably use a direct USB connection. All right, let's now take a look at how to use Rocket Tracker. The first step is to align your telescope using your telescope's control software. I'm using a Celestron 11 Nexstar, and that's going to be using Next Remote to connect to the telescope. Sometimes I also use a Nexstar 4SE, and again, I use Next Remote for this application to be able to control the telescope and align it. Now, in some launch tracking mode options, you'll either not need to align at all, or you can use a pseudo alignment where you're not really aligning on anything, you're just fooling the telescope into thinking it's aligned. For example, just point it anywhere, give it a one star alignment, tell it it's pointed at Polaris, and off you go, even though you're not really aligned on anything at all but the slew to horizon and weight mode will rely on the telescope's alignment. So you'll need to align on at least uh, one star or planet or the moon to truly align the telescope so that it has a reliable uh, alignment that it can use to point the telescope at the spot on the horizon where the rocket's going to rise. So let's talk about the launch tracking modes for, for a moment. Regular predictive tracking is the legacy predictive tracking option that was available in earlier versions of Rocket Tracker. All of these predictive tracking options will use data from flightclub.io, and you can find a link to that website in the video description, and I highly recommend you go over there and join as a member to Flight Club, because that will give you access to Declan's predictions of upcoming launch trajectories, and you can use his predictions in Rocket Tracker to predictively track 
the rocket based on the expected trajectory. Regular predictive tracking will not take into account where the telescope is actually pointed. It will be important to do at least a pseudo alignment where you treat it as if you're aligning on at least one star in order to fool it into thinking it's aligned if you intend to use video based tracking. That will require the telescope to be at least fooled into thinking it's aligned. So, for example, you can tilt the telescope up roughly at the number of degrees corresponding to your latitude and tell it that it's pointed at Polaris. It doesn't matter if it's not accurate. It at least gets it in the ballpark and operating in such a way that it will accept the coordinates that it's receiving from Rocket Tracker for tracking with the video tracking option. If you don't use the video tracking at all, you can actually get away with not even aligning the telescope at all, but just using the joystick. But that will limit you to only using joystick based corrections, at least with uh, next star scopes in my experience. Your mileage may vary depending on your exact telescope model. Adaptive predictive tracking will again require you to at least do a pseudo alignment on a single star or if you prefer you can even do a real alignment say on the moon if it's up. But what this will do is it will actually sync to the pad location at T0. So when liftoff occurs it will set, send a sync command to the telescope syncing it to the launch pad's predicted coordinates which it's going to pull from the flight club data. So again it's important that you enter your location information accurately both in flight club and in rocket tracker. Both are going to be important so you can add, enter your latitude and your longitude here in rocket tracker and that information should also be entered into flight club when you generate the altitude azimuth data to load into rocket tracker. So it will sync on the pad location and then as the rocket lifts off it will actually look at where the telescope is currently pointed and either fast forward or rewind to the closest spot on the trajectory uh, to where the telescope is currently pointed. So this is especially helpful for, helpful for very dynamic launches for example with an LZ-1 landing. When a Falcon 9 or a Falcon Heavy side booster comes back to land at the Cape it will be falling basically at Mach 1 at terminal velocity right before it turns on the landing burn. And so when it turns on the landing burn, it's carrying very little fuel. And even with only one to three rocket engines running, it will decelerate extremely quickly. And if the prediction for when that landing burn starts is off even by a few seconds, it can feel quite bad when trying to track it. And you can be fighting the prediction instead of it working with you. So adaptive predictive tracking will actually look at where you're currently pointed and if you are, for example, further along in the trajectory than was expected, it will fast forward to that point. If, you're, if you are lagging behind where it expected the rocket to be, it will rewind to that point and give you a smoother feel as you track some of these very dynamic LZ-1 landings. I used this option for the most recent Falcon Heavy that involved an LZ-1 landing, USSF-67, and you can see that footage on my channel. In fact, this option saved me because for a moment I actually lost the booster during the descent before the landing burn, but it came right back because it was still playing back the adaptive predictive trajectory, and so even though I was just holding a constant stick deflection and starting to look over at the viewfinder camera to try to find it again, it came back in on its own, which was very cool to see. The slew to horizon and weight option is a new option that I've developed for tracking rocket launches from very far away. I used this on the most recent Falcon Heavy, which was a fully expendable launch, but I tracked it from over 140 miles away, and using this option, the telescope slewed to the spot on the horizon where the trajectory predicted the rocket would start to rise at the horizon, and it waited there until the expected time when the rocket would start to rise, which in that case was about 45 seconds after launch. Then it started to track it at the expected rates, and some seconds later, it rose over my neighbor's roofline and it was immediately in the field of view of my Canon camera riding on a refractor piggyback on the telescope. So that was very cool to see. And the intention for this mode is to be able to do things like track Starship as it launches from Boca Chica even though I'm in Florida. Starship will be flying south of Florida if it makes it through second stage separation and continues on into the second stage burn at some point it will in fact rise from my position in Florida 
and pass south of my location in Florida. So this option allows me to slew the telescope to the spot on the horizon where Starship will rise, and so at liftoff it will slew there and wait until it rises and then start tracking at the expected rates based on the trajectory and allow me to hopefully be able to get Starship in the field of view even if it's difficult to see it during the day. So we'll see how that goes, but at least with the latest Falcon Heavy launch I was able to prove that this method of tracking also works and is a viable option for tracking rocket launches from well over 100 miles away. So this can be quite useful as well. All right, let's talk for a moment about how to download data from Flight Club for use in Rocket Tracker. So if you have a photographer's account on Flight Club and you log into that account, you can use the DataViz tab and use the Out As Generator under Data Dumps to generate altitude azimuth coordinates for use in Rocket Tracker. So if I click this option, it gives me two options to pick from. One, setting the location. I've set Space View Park here as an example and then you can pick an upcoming or even historic mission. So there's a few upcoming missions that you can immediately click on and pick from, or you can search historic trajectories, for example, Artemis 1. So if I click on Artemis 1, it will take a moment to load that trajectory data and render a prediction from that location. So you can see here that I can pick various options for download. I can choose to download the trajectory of the SLS core stage or the SRBs or the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the ICPS, or the Orion capsule. So I can download any of these as CSVs and any of these can be loaded into Flight Club as a trajectory prediction. Let's now take a look at how to track using these predictive trajectories. Okay, so the next step is to start connecting hardware to Rocket Tracker. The first is the camera. You can pick your camera using an index number for camera number here, and I recommend starting at index number 700. This is usually the default first camera in Windows. Sometimes this will be the embedded webcam on a laptop. Sometimes this will be the first external camera connected to the computer or the laptop. So it takes just a little bit of experimentation and trial and error to see. If the 700 index number is the wrong camera, then iterate up from there, 701 to 702, so on and so forth, until you find the camera that you're looking for, and try each one by clicking Start Camera. So in my case, camera 700, is the camera that I'm looking for. This is the finder camera on top of the telescope. This is an ELP camera. You can get these for pretty cheap off Amazon and use them with any standard security camera lens. It's very affordable and I find that this works extremely well as a good balance between performance and cost and weight and CPU overhead. Now, SatTracker does offer an option for ASCOM compatible cameras so that you can use an astronomical CCD. Personally, I don't recommend using an astronomical CCD camera for a viewfinder camera when trying to track a rocket launch. If there's enough demand, I'll port over that functionality into Rocket Tracker as well. But I do strongly recommend using a video for Windows camera for this application. You don't need insane high resolution to do this. In fact, you probably want to have a secondary monitor. That's what I usually use as a small HDMI monitor hooked up directly to the main telescope camera, either some sort of SLR or mirrorless camera. I will typically use a Blackmagic 4K camera, but sometimes I'll use a uh, Canon SLR. And in either case, I'll hook the camera directly up to an external viewing monitor that I'll put next to the computer that allows me to see what the main telescope is seeing. And that's actually what I'll use for primary correction issuing with the joystick. Uh, the viewfinder camera, though, can be useful for tracking objects, including the flame of the rocket. And so during the initial boost phases, you can fully automate things by simply clicking, left clicking with the blue box on the flame of the rocket and track it. You can track it based on the brightness or based on feature-based tracking. So you can track individual features, like it's seeing this number at the corner of the poster and it's locked on to that. Um, but you can also track based on brightness. So if I pick a little bright spot here on the wall, it will track on that instead. And that tends to be, brightness tracking tends to be a less CPU intensive 
the larger the tracking box for feature-based tracking, the more CPU power it's going to consume, and as you can see, the slower the frame rate will run at. And so, again, this relates to the resolution of the camera. If you have a very high HD resolution camera, Rocket Tracker will try to resize the window to fit within the resolution of your monitor, but you are essentially burning a lot of CPU cycles on trying to throw too many pixels at the problem, to be honest. It doesn't take super high resolution to do this kind of tracking. I've been able to do quite good tracking with uh, standard definition cameras using security lenses, uh, riding piggyback on the telescope without consuming too much CPU overhead. And really the key critical factor is a decent frame rate. You really want 30 frames per second. You don't want to get bogged down, in my opinion, by slower ASCOM uh, pass-through frame rates. So again, you can use an ELP camera. Sometimes I'll use a, a, an actual Samsung SDC 435 security camera with a video capture card uh, to pull in some standard def video for tracking with Rocket Tracker. That camera tends to be very sensitive to low light conditions despite its low resolution and that can be useful in some cases as well. So once your camera is running, you can then connect the telescope with the Connect Telescope button. You can choose Telescope Type up here. It will work with the LX200 Classic, though you will not have access to predictive tracking. This will only work with joystick tracking or video-based tracking. ASCOM will work with predictive tracking, so you can pick ASCOM out as. Theoretically, it supports equatorial mounts, but I have not actually tested that uh, lately, and so there are probably some bugs to work out there. Um, but please let me know if you do run into bugs, and I will uh, make updates to the program as needed. Strongly recommend, though, an out as mount for launch tracking. That's going to be the most straightforward way to do it, honestly. So I'm going to pick ASCOM out as and click Connect Telescope, and then pick the Celestron Telescope driver. Click OK. It'll wait a second while it connects. And then if it, if it successfully connects, it will report the maximum slew rates available from the telescope here in the text box. So it's four degrees per second in each axis. If it runs into an issue where the telescope that you are trying to connect to does not actually support the move axis method, it will warn you of that and it will refuse to connect because it cannot, uh, it cannot control that telescope the way it needs to for smooth launch tracking. Now at this point I should note that you should already have a joystick connected to the computer if you intend to use a local joystick to control the telescope. If you connected the joystick after you started the program, you're going to need to click Disconnect Scope to gracefully shut down that connection, and then Stop Camera, and then Exit the program. If you click File, Exit, and Save Configuration, it will save all your settings, including the camera index number, and let you come right back to it after you've connected your joystick. So I'm going to go ahead and click Start Camera and Connect Scope again because I've already got the joystick connected. But it's important to note that if your joystick was not connected when you started the program, it will not work properly. So make sure you connect your joystick first. If you're using a remote joystick, uh, that option is available here. Now this is a feature that I haven't really publicly released yet. The sort of client end of things is already here in Rocket Tracker, but up until now I have not released the server program for this. So you can actually connect to a joystick on a separate computer through the internet if you enter the IP address, the public facing IP address here. Now you will also need to set up port forwarding for that to work on port 3933 at the uh, remote joystick computer and you can then connect uh, once that program is running and listening for a connection you can connect with this button right here uh, that will become the priority joystick if you have a local joystick connected it's generally going to ignore those commands in favor of the remote joystick but more on that in a later video uh, once I release the actual uh, server code for the remote joystick so yes it is actually possible to remotely control the telescope from somewhere else totally remote using uh, a joystick connected to a separate computer. 
the next step is to calibrate the camera. So a couple of things here. You can set the center point that the camera is currently pointing at by clicking set center point and then clicking whatever you're seeing in the main camera view. So if the main uh, camera and the main telescope sees this number right here, I can click here and you see the red box has moved to that spot. Now successive clicks will simply try to lock on to a target, but when you click set center point, the next click you make into the window will set this red box center point. And this is where it's going to try to drive any target that is locked onto with video with the video viewfinder. The purple reticle here is for your reference. And you can reset that to the current crosshair location with reset crosshair. Now I'm going to reset the center point back to roughly where it was. But if I click uh, reset crosshair, it brings that purple circle exactly to where the red box is. Now the purple circle is again for your reference. It's not going to actively actively use that as a set point to drive anything to. But if you are relying on video based tracking and you find that the target is maybe running ahead a bit of where the telescope is actually steering, you can pull it down towards the purple circle and use the purple circle as a reference for where the main camera view truly is even as you adjust the red box in real time. You can do that using the arrow keys. So I'm using the arrow keys on my keyboard to move the red box one pixel at a time so you can essentially drag the target into the purple circle representing your main camera view if it happens to be lagging behind or running ahead slightly of where it ought to be. Um, so you can make real time adjustments using the arrow keys. And you can find that to be useful if you are relying again on video based tracking. So the next step is to calibrate the camera. The computer needs to know what the image scale is, how many degrees uh, are in each pixel, how many pixels correspond to a single degree of sky, essentially. And so the way you do this is by first locking onto a target. Again, you can choose from feature-based tracking or brightness-based tracking. I'm going to use feature-based tracking here. I'm going to lock on to those numbers at the corner of the poster. I'm going to set my calibration speed here. Now this, again, will only affect uh, the calibration speed for ASCOM compatible telescopes, but I'm going to set this at uh, 0.2 degrees per second, fairly leisurely the rate, because we're fairly well zoomed in on here with the uh, security camera. And then I'm going to click camera calibration. And it's going to move the telescope down towards that box, even past it a bit. And it's going to move it, it's going to try to move it 100 pixels and then calculate what the image scale is. So it calculates the image scale to be 0 0.008 degrees per pixel. So that's the image scale. And it's going to use that to know how hard it needs to move the telescope to get any given target at the steering point, that red box that it's going to try to steer each object. Two. So I'm going to right click now to undesignate that target. So left click designates targets, right click undesignates targets if you are pointing your mouse cursor in the, in the video viewfinder window. So now you're ready to start tracking at least with manual tracking. You can use start joystick tracking and you can uh, actually start moving the joystick, you can throttle up and move the joystick around to fully manually move the telescope in whatever direction you like. So uh, if you click stop joystick tracking, then everything comes to a stop. So again, you will use the joystick and the throttle. If I have the throttle all the way down, moving the joystick does nothing. The throttle essentially controls sensitivity. So if I just give it a little bit of throttle, it barely moves even at full stick deflection. This is a full stick deflection right now and as you can see the altitude rate is only 0.17 degrees uh, at per second. So if I give it some more throttle though I can get it moving much faster. So throttle essentially controls sensitivity and maximum speed and joystick deflection controls how hard it's going to move within that range. So I'm going to throttle back down now and stop joystick tracking. So when joystick tracking is on, I can also just track objects using video-based tracking. So if I move down here and I click here to do feature-based tracking, it centers that up 
automatically. So if this were moving, it would try to track it. But as you can see, it's not really moving, so it's just centering it up and leaving it there. So I'll throttle down again and stop joystick tracking. Now we can start setting up for an upcoming launch by loading the launch trajectory file that we downloaded from Flight Club. So if I click File and select Trajectory File, I can pick uh, an upcoming launch or whatever trajectory it is that I want to use for tracking. And you can see it lists the file name and location right there to confirm that it's loaded that and it's ready to go. So now you can set your T0 time. When the program first starts, it will download the upcoming launch list from the internet. If it doesn't have internet access, it will just use the file that was downloaded the last time it had internet access. And you can click this drop down menu and pick the upcoming launch that you want to track. And this will not influence, this drop down will not influence the launch trajectory. You still need to download that yourself from Flight Club. This will only influence the T0 time box here. Now you can customize this, you can change this as long as the string format is the same. So it should read year dash two digit month dash two digit day, then T and then the time in Zulu time or Universal or Greenwich Mean Time of the uh, moment of launch. Now if you click use countdown clock it will rely on the computer's clock and it will start tracking at the moment that you reach this point in time. If you uncheck this box it will use a joystick button to actually control when it start, starts tracking. It will show even with when you're not using the countdown clock it will show the countdown timer and count you down to the expected launch time but it will not start the tracking until you push the button in case the launch is a little delayed. I've had it in the past where SpaceX, for example, has published an upcoming launch time, but they only give it to the nearest minute when they actually have an exact launch time some number of seconds after that minute, but they haven't always uh, published it to the exact second that they actually intend to launch. And so if I rely on the countdown clock and the published T0 time, it's actually not always, it's not always accurate. And so it could actually trigger early, which is not what you want. So sometimes, depending on how much you actually trust the T0 time, it may be best to uncheck the countdown clock and manually trigger it when you actually see engine ignition happen in real time. Now, obviously, that's not going to be an option if you are doing slew to horizon and wait, for example. You have to trust the computer clock, and I would recommend that you use the countdown clock option there. But if you have someone on the phone, perhaps, who's at the launch site, they can tell you when they see engine ignition, and you can use that. But if you're using the webcast, any given webcast, whether it's NASA or SpaceX or what have you, is generally going to have a 30 to 40 second delay, which is going to be unacceptably high for trying to dictate when you should push the button to start tracking. When you push the button for slew to horizon and wait, it will then slew to horizon, but it's going to take the moment that you pushed the button as the T0 time, as the time that liftoff actually occurred. And so you need to keep that in mind. If you're going based on the webcast, it's going to be uh, delayed 30 to 40 seconds. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and do a practice run of tracking. I'm going to set launch tracking mode to slew to horizon and wait. And we're going to play back the launch trajectory that I used for tracking the latest Falcon Heavy launch. Now, while you're waiting for launch, one thing that is important to do is to disable Menu. the tracking mode and tracking. set it to off. Mode. So you go to tracking Track mode. mode and make sure that is turned off. off. After you've aligned the telescope, it will normally be set to out as. So you want to turn that off so it's not tracking at the sidereal rate while you're waiting around for launch. So I'll go ahead and initiate the launch with the laser pointer. And we will go ahead and start tracking at that point in time. Acquiring object. So it does the initial slew to the spot on the horizon where it expects the rocket to rise. Object acquired. And as you can see, it's counting down to the expected rise time.
and it's not going to be perfect in terms of where the laser actually is because I've got a cheap gamepad connected to the other laptop that is actually projecting their laser so it's not necessarily going to match up perfectly but it'll be close enough for demonstration purposes here so you can see it's now expecting the rocket to hit the horizon and it begins tracking at the expected rates so I just use a little bit of joystick correction and I can bring that right in the other thing I can do is I can click on it with uh, the blue box here and have it do video based tracking it's tracking based on brightness and as you can see it brings the rocket to the crosshairs then if I right click to undesignate target I can again take over manual control and use joystick to issue corrections but it will continue to play back the expected rates from the data from flight club and again if I want to set it to automatic I can just click on the target and it will follow it based on video tracking Okay, we'll run the simulation one more time. This time we're going to set launch tracking mode to adaptive predictive. Now in using the slew to horizon and wait mode, because it did a slew, it actually reactivated the out as tracking. So if I go to menu, menu, track mode, off, mode, next star GPS. So I shut down out as tracking again. For now, you'll need to manually disable that when it does the slew to horizon. Uh, if you have a long wait time for the rocket to come up, you may want to go ahead and turn that off in the menu while you're waiting. You can do that while it's counting down for the rocket to rise at the horizon. So I'm going to go ahead and center up on the laser pointer again. Stop joystick tracking. And now arm launch tracking. Again, making sure that I've got adaptive predictive selected. So now this will sync on the pad location at liftoff. It's going to arm launch tracking. I'm going to manually activate the laser to start the launch. And I'm going to push the button. And off we go. So again, I can use video tracking to automatically center up on the rocket. Or I can use joystick tracking. So that's all there really is to it. Rocket Tracker makes it very easy to track these launches, even at relatively high focal lengths with a large telescope like this. So feel free to check it out if you're a channel member. You can download the compiled executable, or you can look at the source code on GitHub and get it that way. Thanks for watching, and until next time, clear skies.